Edison's Conquest of Mars. Chapter 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett P. Service. Read by Seth Adam Schur. Chapter 12. Still the bewildering strains of the music came to our ears, and yet we stood there unperceived, though in the full glare of the chandelier. The girl's face was presented in profile. It was exquisite in beauty, pale, delicate with a certain pleading sadness which stirred us to the heart. An element of romance and a touch of personal interest such as we had not looked for suddenly entered into our adventure. Colonel Smith's mind still ran back to the perils of the plains. A human prisoner. She is a prisoner, he said, and by the seven devils of Donna Anna will not leave her here. But where are the hellhounds themselves? Our attention had been so absorbed by the sight of the girl that we had scarcely thought of looking to see if there was anyone else in the room. Glancing beyond her, I now perceived, sitting in richly decorated chairs, three or four gigantic Martians. They were listening to the music as if charmed. The whole story told itself. This girl, if not their slave, was at any rate under their control, and she was furnishing entertainment for them by her musical skill. The fact that they could find pleasure in music so beautiful was, perhaps, an indication that they were not really as savage as they seemed. Yet our hearts went out to the girl, and were turned against them with an uncontrollable hatred. They were of the same remorseless race with those who so lately had lain waste our fair earth, and who would have completed its destruction had not Providence interfered in our behalf. Singularly enough, although we stood full in the light, they had not yet seen us. Martians guarding her. Suddenly the girl, moved by what impulse I know not, turned her face in our direction. Her eyes fell upon us. She paused abruptly in her playing, and her instrument dropped to the floor. Then she uttered a cry, and with extended arms ran toward us. But when she was near she stopped abruptly, the glad look fading from her face, and started back with terror-stricken eyes, as if, after all, she had found us not what she expected. Then for an instant she looked more intently at us, her countenance cleared once more, and overcome by some strange emotion, her eyes filled with tears, and drawing a little nearer, she stretched forth her hands to us, appealingly. Meanwhile the Martians had started to their feet. They looked down upon us in astonishment. We were like pygmies to them, like little gnomes which had sprung out of the ground at their feet. One of the giants seized some kind of a weapon and started forward with a threatening gesture. The girl appeals to us. The girl sprang to my side and grasped my arm with a cry of fear. This seemed to throw the Martian into a sudden frenzy, and he raised his arm to strike. But the disintegrator was in my hand. My rage was equal to his. I felt the concentrated vengeance of the earth quivering through me as I pressed the button of the disintegrator and, sweeping it rapidly up and down, saw the gigantic form that confronted me melt into nothingness. There were three other giants in the room, and they had been on the point of following up the attack of their comrade. But when he disappeared from before their eyes, they paused, staring in amazement at the place where, but a moment before, he had stood, but where now only the metal weapon he had wielded lay on the floor. At first they started back, and seemed on the point of fleeing. Then, with a second glance, perceiving again how small and insignificant we were, all three together advanced upon us. The girl sank trembling to her knees. In the meantime, I had readjusted my disintegrator for another discharge, and Colonel Smith stood by me with a light of battle upon his face. "'Sweep the discharge across the three! I exclaimed. "'Otherwise there'll be one left, and before we can fire again he'll crush us!' The Martians are killed. The whir of the two instruments sounded simultaneously, and with quick, horizontal motion we swept the lines of force around in such a manner that all three of the Martians were caught by the vibratory streams and actually cut in two. Long gaps were opened in the wall of the room behind them, where the destroying currents had passed, for with wrathful fierceness we had run the vibrations through half a gamut on the index. The victory was ours. 
There were no other enemies that we could see in the house. Yet any moment others might make their appearance, and what more we did must be done quickly. The girl evidently was as much amazed as the Martians had been by the effects which we had produced. Still, she was not terrified, and continued to cling to us and to glance beseechingly into our faces, expressing in her every look and gesture the fact that she knew we were of her own race. But clearly she could not speak our tongue, for the words she uttered were unintelligible. Colonel Smith, whose long experience in Indian warfare had made him intensely practical, did not lose his military instincts, even in the midst of events so strange. "'It occurs to me,' he said, "'that we have got a chance at the enemy's supplies. Suppose we begin foraging right here. Let's see if this girl can't show us the commissary department.' He immediately began to make signs to the girl to indicate that he was hungry. The girl understands us. A look of comprehension flitted over her features, and seizing our hands she led us into an adjoining apartment and pointed to a number of metallic boxes. One of these she opened, taking out of it a kind of cake, which she placed between her teeth, breaking off a very small portion and then handing it to us, motioning that we should eat, but at the same time showing us that we ought to take only a small quantity. "'Thank God! It's compressed food,' said Colonel Smith. I thought these Martians, with their wonderful civilization, would be up to that. And it's mighty lucky for us, because without overburdening ourselves, if we can find one or two more caches like this, we shall be able to reprovision the entire fleet. But we must get reinforcements before we can take possession of the fodder. The prisoner is rescued. Accordingly, we hurried out into the night, passed into the roadway, and taking the girl with us, ran as rapidly as possible to the foot of the tree where we had made our descent. Then we signaled to the electric ship to drop down to the level of the ground. This was quickly done. The girl was taken aboard, and a dozen men, under our guidance, hastened back to the house, where we loaded ourselves with the compressed provisions and conveyed them to the ship. Beautiful girl prisoner. Establishing the identity of the Martian's captive. On this second trip to the mysterious house, we had discovered another apartment containing a very large number of the metallic boxes, filled with compressed food. "'By Jove, it is a storehouse,' said Colonel Smith. "'We must get more force and carry it all off. "'Gracious, but this is a lucky night. "'We can reprovision the whole fleet from this room.' "'I thought it singular,' I said, "'that with the exception of the girl whom we have rescued, "'no women were seen in the house. "'Evidently the lights over yonder indicate the location of a considerable town, "'and it is quite probable that this building without windows "'and so strongly constructed is the common storehouse, "'where the provisions for the town are kept.' The fellows we killed must have been the watchmen in charge of the storehouse, and they were treating themselves to a little music from the slave girl when we happened to come upon them. A new food supply. With the utmost haste, several of the other electrical ships, waiting above the cloud curtain, were summoned to descend, and with more than a hundred men we returned to the building, and this time almost entirely exhausted its stores, each man carrying as much as he could stagger under. Fortunately, our proceedings had been conducted without much noise, and the storehouse being situated at a considerable distance from other buildings, none of the Martians, except those who would never tell the story, had known of our arrival or of our doings on the planet. "'Now we'll return and surprise Edison with the news,' said Colonel Smith. Our ship was the last to pass up through the clouds, and it was a strange sight to watch the others as, one after another, they rose toward the great dome, entered it, though from below it resembled a solid vault of grayish-pink marble, and disappeared. Sunshine again. We quickly followed them, and having penetrated the enormous curtain, were considerably surprised on emerging at the upper side to find that the sun was shining brilliantly upon us. It will be remembered that it was night on this side of Mars when we went down, but our adventure had occupied several hours and now Mars had so far turned upon its axis that the portion of the surface over which we were had come around into the sunlight. We knew that the squadron which we had left besieging the Lake of the Sun must also have been carried around in a similar manner, passing into the night while the side of the planet where we were was emerging into day. Our shortest way back would be by traveling westward, because then we would be moving in a direction opposite to that in which the planet rotated, and the main squadron, sharing that rotation, would be continually moving in our direction. But to travel westward was to penetrate once more into the night side of the planet. 
if I may so call them, of our ships, were accordingly turned in the direction of the vast shadow which Mars was invisibly projecting into space behind it, and on entering that shadow the sun disappeared from our eyes, and once more the huge hidden globe beneath us became a black chasm among the stars. Now that we were in the neighborhood of a globe, capable of imparting considerable weight to all things under the influence of its attraction, that peculiar condition which I have before described as existing in the midst of space, where there was neither up nor down for us, had ceased. Here where we had weight, up and down had resumed their old meanings. Down was toward the center of Mars, and up was away from that center. THE TWO MOONS OF MARS Standing on the deck, and looking overhead as we swiftly plowed our smooth way at a great height through the now imperceptible atmosphere of the planet, I saw the two moons of Mars meeting in the sky, exactly above us. Before our arrival at Mars, there had been considerable discussion among the learned men as to the advisability of touching at one of their moons, and when the discovery was made that our provisions were nearly exhausted, it had been suggested that the Martian satellites might furnish us with an additional supply but it had appeared a sufficient reply to this suggestion that the moons of mars are both insignificant bodies not much larger than the asteroid we had fallen in with and that there could not possibly be any form of vegetation or other edible products upon them this view having prevailed we had ceased to take an interest in the satellites further than to regard them as objects of great curiosity on account of their motions the nearer of these moons phobos is only three thousand seven hundred miles from the surface of mars and we watched it traveling around the planet three times in the course of every day the more distant one deimos twelve thousand five hundred miles away required considerably more than one day to make its circuit it now happened that the two had come into conjunction as i have said just over our heads and throwing myself down on my back on the deck of the electrical ship for a long time I watched the race between the two satellites, until Phobos, rapidly gaining upon the other, had left its rival far behind. Suddenly Colonel Smith, who took very little interest in these astronomical curiosities, touched me, and pointing ahead, said, There they are, rejoining the fleet. I looked, and sure enough there were the signal lights of the principal squadron, and as we gazed, we occasionally saw, darting up from the vast cloud mass beneath, an electric bayonet, fiercely thrust into the sky, which showed that the siege was still actively going on, and that the Martians were jabbing away at their invisible enemies outside the curtain. In a short time the two fleets had joined, and Colonel Smith and I immediately transferred ourselves to the flagship. "'Well, what have you done?' asked Mr. Edison, while others crowded around with eager attention. "'If we have not captured their provision train,' said Colonel Smith, "'we have done something just about as good. "'We have forged on the country, "'and have collected a supply that I reckon will last this fleet for at least a month.' "'What is that? What's that? "'It's just what I say.' "'And Colonel Smith brought out of his pocket "'one of the square cakes of compressed food. "'Set your teeth in that, and see what you think of it, "'but don't take too much, for it's powerful strong.' "'I say,' he continued, We've got enough of that stuff to last us all for a month, but we've done more than that. We've got a surprise for you that will make you open your eyes. Just wait a minute. Caring for the rescued girl. Colonel Smith made a signal to the electrical ship we had just quitted to draw near. It came alongside, so that one could step from its deck onto the flagship. Colonel Smith disappeared for a minute in the interior of his ship, then reemerged, leading the girl whom we had found upon the planet. "'Take her inside, quick,' he said, "'for she is not used to this thin air.' In fact, we were at so great an elevation that the rarity of the atmosphere now compelled us all to wear our airtight suits, and the girl, not being thus attired, would have fallen unconscious on the deck if we had not instantly removed her to the interior of the car. There she quickly recovered from the effects of the deprivation of air, and looked about her, pale, astonished, but yet apparently without fear. Every motion of this girl convinced me that she not only recognized us as members of her own race, but that she felt that her only hope lay in our aid. Therefore, strange as we were to her in many respects, nevertheless she did not think that she was in danger while among us. The circumstances under which we had found her were quickly explained. Her beauty, her strange fate, and the impenetrable mystery which surrounded her excited universal admiration and wonder. 
How came she on Mars? How did she get on Mars? was the question that everybody asked, and that nobody could answer. But while all were crowding around and overwhelming the poor girl with their staring, suddenly she burst into tears, and then, with arms outstretched in the same appealing manner which had so stirred our sympathies when we first saw her in the house of the Martians, she broke forth in a wild recitation which was half a song and half a wail. As she went on, I noticed that a learned professor of languages from the University of Heidelberg was listening to her with intense attention. Several times he appeared to be on the point of breaking in with an exclamation. I could plainly see that he was becoming more and more excited as the words poured from the girl's lips. Occasionally he nodded and muttered, smiling to himself. Her song finished, the girl sank half-exhausted upon the floor. She was lifted and placed in a reclining position at the side of the car. Then the Heidelberg professor stepped to the center of the car, in the sight of all, and in a most impressive manner said, Gentlemen, our sister, I have her tongue recognized. The language that she speaks, the roots of the great Indo-European or Aryan stock, contains. This girl, gentlemen, to the oldest family of the human race belongs. Her language, every tongue that now upon the earth is spoken, antedates. Convinced am I that it, that great original speech, is from which have all the languages of the civilized world sprung. How she came here, so many millions of miles from the earth, a great mystery is. But it shall be penetrated, and it is from her own lips that we the truth shall learn, because not difficult to us shall it be, the language that she speaks, to acquire, since to our skin it is akin." the professor's astonishing statement. This announcement of the Heidelberg professor stirred us all most profoundly. It not only deepened our interest in the beautiful girl whom we had rescued, but in a dim way it gave us reason to hope that we should yet discover some means of mastering the Martians by dealing them a blow from within. It had been expected, the reader will remember, that the Martian whom we had made prisoner on the asteroid might be of use to us in a similar way, and for that reason great efforts had been made to acquire his language, and considerable progress had been effected in that direction. But from the moment of our arrival at Mars itself, and especially after the battles began, the prisoner had resumed his savage and uncommunicative disposition, and had seemed continually to be expecting that we would fall victims to the prowess of his fellow beings, and that he would be released. How an outlaw, such as he evidently was, who had been caught in the act of robbing the Martian gold mines, could expect to escape punishment on returning to his native planet, it was difficult to see. Nevertheless, so strong are the ties of race, we could plainly perceive that all his sympathies were for his own people. In fact, in consequence of his surly manner and his attempts to escape, he had been more strictly bound than before, and to get him out of the way had been removed from the flagship, which was already overcrowded, and placed in one of the other electrical ships, and this ship, as it happened, was one of those which were lost in the great battle beneath the clouds. So after all, the Martian had perished by a vengeful stroke launched from his native globe. But Providence had placed in our hands a far better interpreter than he could ever have been. This girl, of our own race, would need no urging or coercion on our part in order to induce her to reveal any secrets of the Martians that might be useful in our further proceedings. But one thing was first necessary to be done. We must learn to talk with her. Learning her language. But for the discovery of the store of provisions, it would have been impossible for us to spare the time needed to acquire the language of the girl, but now that we had been saved from the danger of starvation, we could prolong the siege for several weeks, employing the intervening time to the best advantage. The terrible disaster which we had suffered in the great battle above the Lake of the Sun, wherein we had lost nearly a third of our entire force, had been quite sufficient to convince us that our only hope of victory lay in dealing the Martians some paralyzing stroke that at one blow would deprive them of the power of resistance. A victory that cost us the loss of a single ship would be too dearly purchased now how to deal that blow, and first of all how to discover the means of dealing it, were at present the uppermost problems in our minds. The only hope for us lay in the girl. If, as there was every reason to believe, she was familiar with the ways and secrets of the Martians, then she might be able to direct our efforts in such a manner as to render them effective. We can spare two weeks for this, said Mr. Edison. 
Can you fellows of many tongues learn to talk with the girl in that time? We'll try it, said several. It shall we do, cried the Heidelberg professor more confidently. Then there is no use of staying here, continued the commander. If we withdraw, the Martians will think that we have either given up the contest or been destroyed. Perhaps they will then pull off their blanket and let us see their face once more. That will give us a better opportunity to strike effectively when we are again ready. Preparing a rendezvous. Why not rendezvous at one of the moons? said an astronomer. Neither of the two moons is of much consequence as far as size goes, but still it would serve as a sort of anchorage ground, and while there, if we were careful to keep on the side away from Mars, we should escape detection. The suggestion was immediately accepted, and the squadron, having been signaled to assemble, quickly bore off in the direction of the more distant moon of Mars, Deimos. We knew that it was slightly smaller than Phobos, but its greater distance gave promise that it would better serve our purpose of temporary concealment. The moons of Mars, like the Earth's moon, always keep the same face toward their master. By hiding behind Deimos we should escape the prying eyes of the Martians, even when they employed telescopes, and thus be able to remain comparatively close at hand, ready to pounce down upon them again after we had obtained, as we now had good hope of doing, information that would make us masters of the situation. End of chapter 12